Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We have a lot to cover once again. Starbase activity barely falters even during hurricane weather as SpaceX press ahead in preparation for Starship Flight 5. There were five orbital launches last week, a technology test satellite from Iran, the crewed MS-26 launch from Roscosmos, and three missions from SpaceX, one of which being the highly anticipated Polaris Dawn, a crewed flight carrying four civilian passengers for five days, which conducted the first commercial spacewalk and flew humans higher in Earth's orbit than anyone since Apollo. The FAA was admonished during the recent Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee hearing for impeding American spaceflight innovation with its excessive red tape and regulations, with Starship being the noticeable elephant in the room, and SpaceX themselves issued a statement that Starship is being delayed for unreasonable and exasperating reasons, as the FAA issued a further minimum 60-day delay to Flight 5. This all happening while China made big strides towards the development of its Zuchu 3 after successfully flying a test vehicle to 10 kilometers and then vertically landing it. Meanwhile, Blue Origin is drawing closer to the maiden flight of New Glenn, christening the booster, so you're telling me there's a chance, as they attempt the first ever booster landing for an unflown rocket. All of this and a whole lot more, so sit back and enjoy. <laughs> You gotta love this shot of Starship vehicles in the rocket garden, including Ship 30 on the left there, the next vehicle in line to fly, captured by Jack Byer. You may be able to tell that the weather isn't looking too good in this shot though. Indeed, Boca Chica Beach was closed for safety as Category 2 Hurricane Francine approached landfall, bringing heavy rain, high winds and flooding. Jack later captured this shot of the road to Starbase flooding, with the left half of the road completely submerged. Happily, the weather cleared up later in the week, so major works could resume at Starbase. You can see that Ship 31 remains at the Massey's test site. So far, it doesn't look like any engine tests have taken place with this vehicle yet, though sometimes it can be hard to tell if smaller tests like spin primes have taken place at this site thanks to its more obscured location. Alongside Ship 31 is Test Tank 16, currently sitting in a tank crushing rig. You can probably see how this works. There's a plate at the top of the tank that gets pulled downwards via hydraulics to enact crushing force onto the test article as a means of strength testing it. Lab Padre also captured footage of the tank undergoing cryo testing recently. Over at the launch pad, the near non-stop work on the chopsticks continues ahead of their catch test during Flight 5. I don't really have a whole lot to add this week without repeating all the talking points from last week's episode of Space This Week, though NASA Spaceflight did spot a worker repainting the orbital launch pad. I think this could probably also be done to the very rusty looking doubler reinforcement points on the arms, which are starting to look a little browned. <laughs> I imagine that these will be grinded and painted black ahead of Flight 5's launch. But when will Flight 5 launch? Well, for a while now, SpaceX have been aiming for a September launch window, but last week the hopes of a launch this month were swiftly dashed by the FAA, because despite the vehicle being ready for launch, regulatory approval is going to require more time. During Flight 5, the booster will ditch its hot stage ring in the same way that it did for Flight 4, but for this flight the ring will splash down in a different spot in the Gulf of Mexico. This therefore prompted the FAA to initiate a new 60-day consultation with the National Marine Fisheries Services, pushing the launch to no earlier than November, and with the added sting that any new questions raised during the consultation period can reset the 60-day counter an indefinite number of times, despite the fact that the ring was already approved to splash down in the ocean and that, statistically, the odds of this new splashdown location having any alternate impact on the environment are essentially zero. SpaceX themselves have had enough, it seems, issuing a statement that Flight 5, Starship and Super Heavy have been ready to launch since the beginning of August and are frustrated that they are continually being delayed by superfluous environmental analysis and for unreasonable and exasperating reasons. Another cited reason for the FAA delay was the fact that the booster will be attempting to land back at the launch pad, which means that its re-entering sonic boom will affect a slightly different area of wildlife, which the FAA felt required a repeat environmental review, despite SpaceX stating that while animals exposed to the sonic booms may be briefly startled, numerous prior studies have shown that sonic booms of varying intensity have no detrimental effect on wildlife. 
So yes, the FAA are continuing to be a somewhat antagonistic force to the continuation of Starship launches, but they're not immune to criticism from the government. In fact, there was a recent Space and Aeronautics subcommittee hearing into encouraging commercial space innovation, in which there was largely bipartisan dressing down of the excessive regulatory barriers imposed by the FAA. SpaceX wasn't mentioned a great deal, but Starship was the elephant in the room during this. I found Georgia Representative Rich McCormick's line of questioning particularly interesting, and I think he was speaking for many of us in asking exactly what has changed. Has something changed? Is there a reason that we're holding up the same process that's already been approved previously? These 27, I think you said advisories, 17 in one year, 10 the next year, that you put out in the last two years, how much has that sped up the process? How much have you internally looked at to speed up the process? How have you been accountable, accountable for passing the very people, the, the process of licensing to make us competitive on the world market, which is maybe your most important thing that you do? FAA's Kevin Coleman replied that with the specific example of Starship Soup Heavy, that with each flight of the vehicle, SpaceX has made changes to the vehicle and flight path, which apparently means that it needs to be completely reassessed, almost as if it's a new launch vehicle every time. Super Heavy, Boca Chica. We issue a 450 license to SpaceX for that activity. You ask what changes. Uh, missions change. Technologies on the vehicle change, which require a modification to the license. It is our intention with 450 to not have to come back to deal with modifications at such a frequent basis. We're up to the fifth flight now. We've had, we have four flights, three of which have been under modifications to the license that have been requested by the company. It is the company that is pushing mission by mission approvals. So you do realize that technology changes literally every day. This is the leading edge technology in the world, whether it be AI, quantum, space exploration. I ask you to streamline your process because I think if you don't, we fall behind and our very way of life is in jeopardy. You're in charge. You make the difference. You get to determine how fast these go through. And if what you're doing is not working, you need to change. I did like that final statement from McCormick that if the FAA can't streamline their approval process, then the US is going to fall behind to competitor nations, which I think is true. I mean, obviously you don't want to have zero regulations like China and just drop spent stages into populated areas, but there is a middle ground between the two. And speaking of China, they're pushing ahead with competitor rockets to the US. For example, Landspace's Zhu Chu 3 launch vehicle successfully conducted a vertical launch to 10 kilometers last week before conducting a powered descent and successful landing. This stainless steel Methalox rocket obviously has a lot of similarities to Starship, but the vehicle is much close to Falcon 9, albeit slightly smaller, at just shy of 3.5 meters wide and a little over 18 meters tall. This is a big step ahead for development though, and it's no secret that China are also developing an answer to Starship. This render from a few years ago shows a very familiar looking vehicle currently being developed by the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, China's main state-owned rocket manufacturer. Speaking at the All In Summit 2024, Elon Musk weighed in on the frustrations of dealing with space regulations. You know, Starship is, the next flight of Starship is ready to fly, we are waiting for regulatory approval. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, 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 it really should not be possible to build a giant rocket faster than the r paper can move from one desk to another. <laughs> Despite setbacks with Starship, SpaceX was still able to make history last week with the launch of Polaris Dawn. This was set to become the first ever crewed mission to conduct a spacewalk from Dragon and was to fly humans higher in Earth's orbit than anyone since Apollo, so to call this mission highly anticipated would be an understatement. And last Tuesday, things were looking good for launch. The Dragon crew was formed of mission commander Jared Isaacman, who previously commanded Inspiration 4, the first all-civilian mission to space, mission pilot Scott Petit, 
a retired United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, Mission Specialist and Medical Officer Anna Menon, a lead Space Operations Engineer at SpaceX, and Second Mission Specialist Sarah Gillis, a SpaceX Senior Operations Engineer. The crew had been training for this day for two and a half years, and excitement levels were high as they departed the suit-up room on their way to the pad at 39A. And then, well, the rocket launched, <laughs> marking Dragon's 14th human spaceflight mission, heading to an elliptical orbit of 190 by 1,200 kilometers, where it would orbit the Earth roughly eight times before raising itself to an apogee of 1,400 kilometers. The highest humans have traveled in Earth's orbit since the Apollo program and at an altitude three times higher than the space station. And here's the money shot of the capsule at 1,400.7 kilometers, showing the forward bulkhead Draco firing. After completing six orbits at this height, Dragon lowered itself to an orbit of around 190 by 742 kilometers over the course of around five hours in preparation for Thursday's spacewalk. On the day of the EVA, the crew calmly awaited the spacewalk while the Dragon's capsule pressure slowly lowered to vacuum levels. And once depressurization had completed, we saw our first view of the Dragon's forward hatch open. If it were me in one of those seats, I would have probably been terrified. But then again, the crew has spent two and a half years preparing for this, so this is something they'll have doubtlessly rehearsed countless times. We then saw Jared Isaacman egress the vehicle, connected by an umbilical, going through a series of suit mobility tests that test the overall hand-body control, vertical movement with Skywalker, the forward frame on Dragon to support EVAs, and foot restraint, while Dragon flew between Australia and Antarctica. After completing these tests, he re-embarked the vehicle, and then it was the turn of mission specialist Sarah Gillis, who went on EVA to perform the same series of suit mobility tests completed by Isaacman. These were again completed successfully, and after she re-embarked the vehicle, the hatch was closed and an extensive series of leak and systems checks were completed. The mission wasn't just about setting a record apogee and a spacewalk though. The crew conducted around 40 science and research experiments for various causes, and we even had a musical performance from Sarah Gillis, performing the violin in support of El Sistema USA, a non-profit music education program that works to ensure every child has access to high-quality music education, as well as St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Liv Perotto is a cancer survivor who was treated there, and she was asked to design the mission's zero-g indicator, which is typically a plush toy that indicates when you're in zero G by floating, <laughs> and she came up with Asteroid, a cuddly Shiba astronaut who joined the Polaris crew on their mission. Anyway, as the mission drew to a close, Dragon conducted a deorbit burn and its nose cone was closed, and SpaceX shared this really cool looking tracking shot of the capsule during re entry. We then saw, first of all, the deployment of the capsule's drogue chutes followed by the deployment of its four main parachutes, after which we then had confirmation of successful splashdown off the coast of Florida. Recovery operations swiftly commenced, and the capsule's door was opened, giving us a view of the crew after their return from space. Crew egress was then conducted, wrapping up the end of the Polaris Dawn mission. And in addition to the milestones previously mentioned, the mission marked the furthest flight from Earth made by women, with Menon and Gillis, and at the age of 30 years, Sarah Gillis is now the youngest person to participate in a spacewalk. Furthermore, the spacewalk set a new record for the number of people, four, simultaneously exposed to the vacuum of space. There are two more missions planned for the Polaris program. The second mission will be another Crew Dragon flight, the objectives for which will be set according to data from Polaris Dawn, and the third mission is planned to be the first ever crewed Starship launch, which will take place after Starship makes at least 100 successful cargo flights, though this is so far not a hard and fast requirement. Polaris Dawn wasn't the only crewed flight of the week. Wednesday saw the launch of a Soyuz 2.1A from Baikonur, carrying Roscosmos cosmonauts Alexei Ovchinin and Ivan Wagner, and NASA astronaut Don Pettit to the International Space Station for a six-month mission. A few hours after launching, the spacecraft autonomously docked to the Russian Prechal module of the station, and hatch opening took place not long after. In addition to Polaris Dawn, SpaceX conducted two other Falcon 9 missions on Thursday and Friday, respectively. Thursday's mission saw the Falcon 9 lift off from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 40, carrying five Bluebird communication satellites for the Texan company AST Spacemobile, who plan on building a satellite constellation that will allow unmodified smartphones to connect to satellites in areas with coverage gaps, similar to SpaceX's direct-to-cell capable Starlink satellites. The five satellites were deployed about an hour after launch, and Falcon 9's first stage successfully landed on Landing Zone 1 at Cape Canaveral, completing its lucky 13th mission. 
Station. Friday's Falcon 9 was a standard Starlink launch, which saw the rocket carry 21 satellites to Shell 9 from Vandenberg, and Falcon 9's first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship in the Pacific Ocean, completing its 18th mission. The only other orbital launch of the week came from Iran. This was on Saturday and saw them launch the Keem 100 space launch vehicle from the Sharud Space Center, carrying the Chamran 1 research satellite to low Earth orbit. Built by the Space Department of the Iran Electronics Industries, with the mission to examine how its hardware and software systems behave in low Earth orbit and validate its orbital maneuvering technology. Blue Origin is getting very close to the first launch of New Glenn. Dave Limp announced on Twitter that the first stage has been officially named, so you're telling me there's a chance, in reference to the fact that Blue Origin will be attempting to land the booster on its very first launch, something that has never been done before. The only examples of similar rockets really being Falcon 9 and Starship, which both started out with soft water landings rather than recovery. Blue Origin are confident that they'll pull it off, but Limp continued that if they don't, they'll learn and keep trying until they do. What do you think will successfully land first? New Glenn first stage or Starship Super Heavy? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. If I had to bet, I'd probably lean closer to New Glenn, but the timings are definitely close. Laon Aerospace was also back in action last week. I decided to create something I've always wanted to try. A self-unpacking, self-assembling surface base in a box. I think it turned out better than expected, and is definitely one of the most satisfying things I've built in Kerbal Space Program. If the video sounds like a good time, then it should be on screen right now for you to click on, as well as the names of my Patreon and YouTube channel members who make all of this possible. So huge thank you to everyone on the right there. But that is the end of today's episode of Space This Week. Leave a like down below if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.